I'm Gene Coletta, editor of the Latin America Advisor Publications at the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington. Among the challenges facing countries as they struggle to deal with the coronavirus pandemic is the availability of adequate medical supplies to face the pandemic. Among the experts who have been studying this question uh, is Annabelle Gonzalez. She's a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics and a former trade minister of Costa Rica from where she joins us today. Thanks for joining us, Annabelle. And let me begin by asking, do Latin America and the Caribbean countries in that region, do they have enough medical supplies to meet their needs? And how do you see that in terms of the availability of supply to do what needs to be done to face the pandemic? Well, hi, Jean, and thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, at, times, uh, at times like this, in such a, a health crisis, there is no one country that has enough medical supplies, medical gear, medical product uh, to fight the pandemic. Uh, this is why trade plays such a critical role uh, in moving uh, this equipment from where it is produced to where it is needed. Uh, and this is why uh, there are a number of trade policy measures uh, that governments should take uh, to make sure that they can have access to this medical gear and they can have access uh, at a, a affordable uh, prices and in a timely manner. All right, and when you look at the trade policies that exist in Latin America and the Caribbean, and you look at the trade policies in the countries that provide equipment to countries in that region, uh, how do you see it? Are trade policies adequate or are there problems that exist that need to be fixed? Well, let me say that I believe that there are a number of measures that can be taken and some of them are being uh, taken. For example, uh, countries can lower their import tariffs on uh, this basic medical equipment, medical gear. And when you look, for instance, at uh, pharmaceuticals and other products, uh, tariffs are relatively low in the region. But then you go and look at soap, for example, which is, of course, the first line of defense against the virus. And we see that a number of countries have high tariffs on, on soap uh, of uh, up to 15%. Um, so one very important measure that governments can take is to uh, reduce or eliminate uh, tariffs on these uh, products. Second is that they may need to facilitate uh, the inspection and release of goods coming through customs. Uh, because sometimes in, in the region, this is the case uh, in a number of countries, um, you know, it can take uh, some time uh, to be to release the goods. And, uh, you know, when you are a patient or a doctor at the hospital, time is the essence. So a number of countries uh, in other uh, places, for instance, have established green lanes uh, to facilitate uh, the importation of this critical medical uh, supplies. Uh, a third um, measure that countries can take is that they can expedite uh, the conformity assessment uh, uh, processes of some of this equipment. Because as we know, uh, you know, medical gear is subject to a number of technical standards to protect you know, consumers' uh, uh, safety and health. But you know, sometimes uh, they have the, um, uh, the, the, the negative impact in the sense that they make importation process take longer. So again, uh, all of this conformity assessment procedures to verify uh, the technical standards of the products can be expedited. Uh, governments can also facilitate, for instance, the movement of uh, health personnel. And we have seen some, we saw some very compelling uh, letters, for instance, coming out of Wuhan and then from Italy, um, asking for more doctors. And uh, say New Jersey in the, in the U.S. Uh, has facilitated uh, the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, doctors coming from other countries to actually be able to work in New Jersey. Well, these are measures that countries in the region could also uh, take uh, to uh, have access to uh, medical expertise at times of needs. Um, fostering digital communications, for example, as well. Digital exchanges about the experience that other countries have had in fighting uh, the uh, measures. And, and finally, uh, in terms of you know, this sort of set of measures, it's important that all countries make sure that regimes currently in place, either regulatory regimes or intellectual property regimes, do not hinder access to uh, vital uh, you know, uh, vaccine when it's developed or antiviral drugs uh, and others. So these are like a set of things that countries can do. But there are also things that countries should not do. Um, and this goes to your question, uh, which is 
um, imposing export bans or export restrictions on this critical medical supply. And unfortunately, we are seeing a lot of that. Uh, but this is not only very detrimental to importing countries, uh, because, you know, 10 countries across the world concentrate the exports of, uh, of almost three quarters of medical products uh, and almost two thirds of the basic medical equipment that is required to fight the pandemic. So if all countries go out there and begin to impose export restrictions on these products, this is gonna have a very uh, detrimental effect uh, to most countries across the world. But these export restrictions are not only detrimental to importing countries, they are very detrimental to the exporting countries as well because they increase prices, they disincentivize uh, investment, and they invite retaliation. And since there is no one country in the world that can produce all the medical equipment, all the medical gear that is required to fight this pandemic, it's much better to rely on international trade than to think that any one single country will be able to produce everything that is needed. Right, now when we look at the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, how much of the medical equipment that is needed in the region is produced locally and how much of it comes from outside and what are the outside sources um, of the uh, medical equipment that is needed in Latin America and the Caribbean um, and what is happening in those outside sources is um, it, uh, do those places have adequate policies in order to get um, uh, products to Latin America or is there a long way that needs to go yet? Well, it depends very much on, uh, on the product, but there are some very interesting things already happening in the region, for instance. Uh, we saw that, uh, for instance, uh, Haynes Brand, the company that produces t-shirts and underwear in a number of countries in the region, has retrofitted some of its facilities in uh, Honduras, the Dominican Republic, and El Salvador uh, to produce uh, cotton masks. Uh, for, uh, for, for fighting the virus. And part of that production uh, will go uh, to the U.S., will go to global markets, but a part of the production will also stay uh, in those countries. We're seeing other countries that are looking at producing uh, medical respirators as well, uh, again, with exporting part of the production and keeping some of the production uh, at home. So I think what can, what can be very important is to, and this is an idea that I've, uh, that I've been advocating, which is, um, you know, we can think about putting together a compact, a compact where you would have uh, large manufacturers uh, committing to, you know, begin the production of some of this equipment, as is, as is already happening, as I was mentioning. We need to make sure, of course, that supply chains are open. Uh, we know that because of the restrictions on air travel, it's difficult to find uh, capacity today or prices have gone up uh, significantly. So it's important to have, uh, to keep those trade uh, lanes open so that the goods can move uh, back and forth. Um, we would also need a commitment on the part of those countries, say, on a country like Honduras or the Dominican Republic or others, uh, that those products that will be produced in, in their countries will not face export restrictions because then this will um, basically uh, you know, erode uh, all the effort that is being made. But you also need uh, you know, the right type of policies on the part of those uh, um, sort of advanced economies, if you wish. Uh, one of them, for example, is that you, you, you know, countries should avoid um, localization policies or policies requiring that all products be manufactured in their own countries, because then they would not be able to be part of this uh, initiative to increase the supply of medical gear. And finally, I do think that there is a very important role uh, for international financial institutions like the World Bank uh, or other regional development banks uh, to support these countries in terms of putting in place the right set of policies to make a compact like this work, uh, to provide support in, the, in terms of their uh, own health systems, for instance, and managing the supply chain uh, in the um, uh, public health uh, systems. And also, uh, uh, quite frankly, in, uh, in you know, providing resources to buy uh, some of this uh, equipment that is uh, vital from the region. I think the fact that you know, the virus is coming a little bit later uh, to the region as compared uh, to other parts of the world uh, provides a bit of opportunity to learn uh, from the things that have been done uh, you know, right and the things that have been done wrong in other parts of the world and apply them and bring them to the region.
All right, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the multilateral organizations. I wanted uh, to see if you could elaborate that, on that a little bit. Uh, you mentioned the World Bank and other multilateral organizations. How would you assess what those organizations are doing right now? And uh, what more perhaps should they be doing in order to make sure that medical supply chains to Latin America and the Caribbean stay intact and that those countries are getting the supplies that they need? Well, I think that uh, the international organizations are moving very rapidly to support the region in many different ways. Uh, and certainly uh, on the part that relates to, you know, putting in place the right set of policies or providing the financial aid that is required, uh, I think that they are doing a very important job. Uh, one important organization is, of course, the World Trade Organization. And I think that uh, although the World Trade Organization has faced some challenges recently, uh, it is uh, an excellent forum uh, to try to promote global cooperation uh, to be able to combat uh, the virus. And so we were talking before about, for instance, the importance of eliminating tariffs at the country level, where countries could also come together uh, and bound those uh, reduced tariffs uh, in the context of the WTO to provide the certainty that is required to increase production. Or countries may come to the WTO as well uh, to negotiate, uh, you know, very strict conditions for the adoption of those export restrictions that we were mentioning before that are so detrimental uh, to countries in the region and across the world. So there are, you know, the financial institutions, I think, are doing a, a great effort uh, to try to support countries in the region. Uh, more is required, but I wouldn't say it's that much from the organization but rather from member governments that need to come together and prioritize global cooperation to fight a global uh, threat as the COVID-19. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Uh, you've uh, shed a lot of light on this uh, subject for us, uh, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Dean. I appreciate it myself. Annabelle Gonzalez, Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute of International Economics and former Trade Minister of Costa Rica. Uh, joining us on the topic of medical supply chains in Latin America and the Caribbean. I'm Gene Coletta, editor of the Latin America Advisor Newsletters at the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington.